I'm live. I had forgotten that I had agreed to let you show that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I am so brand new at my job, I cannot remember the schools that uh, make up the Herberger Institute. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks to Janet and, and Tomer, who uh, were very helpful in helping think about the theme for today. Um, I think we got the order wrong. Tom, you're supposed to put uh, the speaker before the artist because it's very hard to be as inspiring as the two acts. Uh, Gwendolyn, that was uh, a beautiful poem. Um, and uh, the Two Star Symphony, what an incredible process. In fact, I'd like to use that process for the talk today. <laughs> so we, uh, we're going to do this together. It's a collective speech. And uh, you, got, you ready? You go first. Uh, huh. Uh, actually, come, this is almost coming home for me. Uh, I began my work uh, in, in the arts and cultural policy about 16 years ago when I was at Princeton. And uh, Marion Godfrey at the Pew Charitable Trust and Alberta Arthurs uh, put me on an assignment to figure out whether meetings matter in arts and culture, because we go to lots of meetings. So uh, the way to do this is, uh, yeah, I was going to go to 25 different arts meetings in a year. And this was my first one, Grant Makers in the Arts. So if you want to know whether your meetings matter, there's a white paper I wrote. Um, <laughs> but actually, that's why I haven't go gone to another arts meeting since then. Um, the, uh, so I'm going to wander about a little bit. Um, and I guess I probably should get my, my little clicker going. Um, so I want to talk today about the idea of uh, the arts uh, and bigger than me experiences in a world that seems to work against bigger than me experiences. Uh, this, I just wrote an article for the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, which uh, came out a couple weeks ago that this talk is based on. I'm going to grab my water from over here. Okay, this is a long wind up. Um, okay, so first, raising Arizona. This is, uh, since I've been in the desert for just uh, a few months now, here are some quotes. Um, First from my wife, um, it's a dry heat, yeah, so is an oven. Um, that was August 8th. This is me, wow, I've never seen anything like that before, and that's pretty much every day since I arrived, July 1st, but specifically a week after I arrived, we got this, uh, which is a haboob that came across the, uh, the valley, and I, I had one friend in... Uh, in Phoenix, uh, and I called him when I started getting the alerts on the phone and said, what should I do? It says a dust storm. And he said, oh, it's, you know, I said, should I lock the door? Should I close the windows? What, what am I supposed to do? He said, oh, it's no big deal. If you're driving to Tucson, you might pull over um, if you can't see, but otherwise go about your business. So I took my family on bicycles to ride on the canal <laughs> to dinner, and this is what we uh, encountered. Um, this is Bob's quote, uh, I dream of the day when the national press coverage about Arizona is that it was hot and folks spent a quiet day <laughs> by the pool. Um, and this is anonymous uh, for the desert. If it looks dead, it isn't, <laughs> which I think is useful when I'm hiking or otherwise uh, moving about, but it's actually a pretty good metaphor for most things in life, so, um, especially running a big art school. Um, okay, so I want to start with... Uh, with this notion of, uh, of engagement uh, and a book that Bill Ivey and I worked on called um, Engaging Art, the Next Great Transformation of America's Cultural Life. And we were given the challenge by the Wallace Foundation to think about this problem, uh, the, the, the passing of the great cultural generation. Um, and this was largely framed by looking at the uh, SPPA data over time and what was happening in terms of attendance at the benchmark art forms, and these are numbers that you've all seen. But in general, they're not moving in the direction that we'd, that we'd like to see. And in fact, we wrote the book following 2002, and you see the trends have just continued since then. Um, of course, this is Mark Twain. Uh, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, or what I call the Robert Putnam fallacy. Um, Putnam wrote the book called Bowling Alone, and he made the argument that uh, the great civic generation in America had passed. Um, and then everybody sort of came out of the woodworks and said, well, you're counting the wrong things. You're looking at the wrong things. Actually, there's lots of civic uh, participation in American life. They just may not be the old Rotary Clubs. They may be the new soccer clubs or the many other places that people were gathering. 
And so, uh, so we started asking that same kind of question for the arts. Well, maybe the benchmark art forms are not uh, the place to look uh, for, uh, for what's happening in terms of culture and creativity. And we wrote a book, and here are some of the, you know, the, the statistics in that, in that presentation, and, and many of you will be familiar with this. We talked about the rise of the pro-ams, the professional amateurs, who are really good at what they do, but maybe they don't get uh, paid uh, as, as full-time work. We looked at the rise in, in playing instruments in the family home, and we saw that that was increasing. Uh, the number of guitar sales had increased by three times, and that there were what we call these weekend warriors, again, these pro-ams that are dedicating lots of time, energy, extremely highly talented, uh, uh, working and presenting and, and playing and, and drawing and exhibiting their work. Um, I had a, uh, this is a, from a slide from a colleague at Northwestern who surveyed uh, young people, but the, the Pew Charitable Trust has done this survey, the Internet and Public Life, and we've just seen over and over again how much activity young people are actually doing and making. This is just uh, from her survey of college students, but, you know, uh, a, more than a quarter said that they made music and posted it online, and that's not just curating a list, but actually composing music or, or mashing it up, creating new, new music, and then sharing it with their friends, the number of students who are writing poetry or fiction and posting it, visual arts. Uh, again, these numbers are so much higher than those numbers we were seeing in the survey of public participation in the art. You look at YouTube, right? Six billion hours of video are watched each month on YouTube. Um, and that's incredible, and, and that's probably too much. We'll, we'll all agree on that. But someone is producing that content, and much of that content is being produced by these pro-ams, by people who are really good and posting things that other people want to watch. Um, the maker movement is clearly uh, a sign that, the, that creativity and, and arts and crafts are alive and well. Um, you know, hundreds of fab labs are being created all over the U.S. Um, in, 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 in cities, uh, on campuses. Um, the DOD has funded 1,000 uh, high-tech um, maker spaces in public high schools. Um, okay, so that's the first bit of good news that we sort of wrote about in our book. That actually, you know, we were, we were, we were experiencing a creative renaissance in this country. And if we stand to the side and complain about what we're losing, that we're not taking advantage of where we need to be. That this is a wonderful, exciting, robust time for creativity, and we need to be in the middle of that stream. Um, good news 2.0. Uh, there's a healthy interest among young people in spending their lives in the arts. This is a MIT Lem Lemelson Index um, asking high school kids what they want to do with their careers, but the arts are twice as high uh, as uh, interest in, in business, um, science. Uh, they rank up there with, with medicine. Um, again, and, and, and young people probably have a very broad idea of what this means to spend their life in the arts. It may not be our definition, but they want to spend their lives doing creative things. We've also seen this in terms of enrollments at, uh, at design and arts colleges across America. This is a huge increase. This is all visual and performing arts degrees. This is from the National uh, Cultural Index that the Americans for the Arts puts together. Um, but you see that from, uh, from 1998, about 80,000 uh, people were graduating every year in the visual and performing arts. That's just a huge army of artists that were graduating into the world. It's now up uh, well over 120,000. Um, so uh, again, uh, th these are signs of health. These are not signs uh, of decline. Um, and arts graduates add their cultural vitality uh, to our arts ecology all the time. Not all of them are able to make money as artists throughout their lives, but about 65% of all arts graduates do work as professional artists at some point. In fact, that's higher than most majors. So more artists get to work as artists than accountants work as accountants. Um, so the idea that if you go and study the arts, you'll never be an artist is simply a fallacy. It's not true. Um, but many of these artists, whether they're professional or not, are working on their art avocationally in their non-work time. And importantly, many of them are not only working on it, but presenting it publicly, um, exhibiting it, uh, performing it. So if you added all those graduates, about three million arts graduates in this country, and all the work that they're doing advocationally to present their work publicly, it's about 1.4 million arts graduates who are actively presenting their work to the world, not as professional artists, but as advocational artists. It's a huge part of our arts ecology, and it's uh, something we should celebrate. Um, We've seen that the total number of nonprofit arts organizations continues to rise, right? So people see this still as an opportunity space to invest in, to create ideas, to share those ideas 
with others. And 20 percent, 16 to 20 percent of all of these arts graduates, over 150,000 again, who are graduating every year um, from our art schools, are starting companies, are starting new businesses, for profit and not for, not for profit. So again, this is the sign of a healthy ecology. There's lots of churn here. Um, and of course, we've seen the rebound in giving to the arts, which is, uh, which is, a, which is a happy sign indeed. And public funding, this is not adjusted for inflation. So these, these charts look not as good when we adjust for inflation. But there's some stabilization in public funding. Um, and in some ways, maybe the funding question is a little bit besides the point. Um, I want to share with you a very brief story about um, uh, a conference I went to in Salzburg called the Performing Arts in Lean Times. All the, several of the major performing arts institutions in the U.S. were represented, and then other artists from across the world were there as well. And the major institutions were, were talking for about two days about what happens because of a 10% cut in their budget and how devastating that was and all the outreach activities they had to pull back on and so forth and so on. At the end of the meeting, uh, Mulenga Kapwepe stood up, she's from Zambia, and she said, I don't understand this conversation at all. It makes no sense to me. She said, uh, uh, last year, you know, we, did a, we did a performance for uh, a few hundred dollars in my village, and a thousand people walked overnight to see the performance from, from neighboring villages. So what is this? That, we, that you cannot be compelling or relevant because you have, uh, you're seeing a 10% a cut in your budget. If you do compelling work, people will travel to see it. Um, and it really shifted that conversation entirely. Bad News 2.0 is a reflection I've had over the last 10 years since writing Engaging Art. Right? We, I celebrated this renaissance of creativity. I still do. Right? But the more I think about what we've created, I think it's a type of eye creativity. Right? It's a creativity focused on what I have to say to the world, my voice, um, the IWW, IWW, HIW, I generation. Everybody knows what that is, right? No? I want what I want, when and how I want it, right? We talked about the curatorial me, the idea that <clears throat> people can curate their cultural experience to be just what they want when they want it. This is a remarkable statistic that I think um, sheds light on this phenomena. <laughs> I'm serious. This is a true statistic. These are high school students that have been surveyed over 50 years. You will not find a statistic that's that significant in terms of the gap between, uh, between 1950 and 1990. Um, one way in which this is manifesting is, is what uh, trend research, research, researchers call life catching, which is I'm not, if I'm a young person, I'm not going to engage in an experience unless I can capture myself in it and share it with someone else. And if you, cannot, if you cannot make it autobiographical, it is not worth doing. I took my daughter to a Taylor Swift concert um, last year in Nashville, and uh, the whole concert was sort of set up to allow for these life-catching moments, places where she could stand in front of a poster or a stage set and get her picture taken and text it or, 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 or put it on social media right away. Um, C. Wright Mills has sort of called this the exuberant expression of self. That's the, that's the time that we're living in. Um, and there are kind, all kinds of challenges that come with this. Part of this uh, exuberant expression of self has to do with the technologies that allow us to customize and create those, I want that experience when and how I want it. Um, so we have this buzzing, beeping, poking, texting, tagging world that all of us are part of, but our, the, the rising generation is more a part of it than we can even imagine. Um, here are some statistics uh, that I think should cause pause. A half of teens who send any text send uh, 100 texts per day. Over 700 mil million daily Facebook users that have post original content 36 times a month. Over 500 million Twitter users with an average of 307 tweets each. Um, and here's what worries me about this kind of frenetic technological world of poking, um, beeping, ta texting, tagging. Um, here's some researchers at the University of Southern California who have actually, these are brain scientists, who have actually looked at what, the brain, what happens to the brain when it goes into an empathic state, when it has to think about what someone else might be feeling or thinking. And the brain has to slow down for that process. 
And what we do when we're hyper, um, when, we're, uh, uh, when we're stimulated by so many different uh, technological uh, devices and screens is that our brain actually flees. It flees from one thing to the other. And it doesn't stay long enough to, uh, to think about what someone else might be feeling. So they have raised the, the possibility that our ability to empathize with others could be affected by this highly frenetic, um, always connected, always on world that we're in. Um, the other thing that we're facing is, is this feeling of being time squeezed or time crunched. And again, I think it has something to do with always being on, never being off, always being connected, always being uh, contacted by uh, someone you're serving, someone you're working with, um, a piece of work that you, uh, that you have to do. Um, this is a pretty amazing statistic that the average increase in hours worked uh, has gone up by about 660 hours per year. Um, and that's showing up in all kinds of ways, including the fact that we don't take lunch breaks anymore. 65% um, of employees either eat at their desk or don't take a lunch break. There's other statistics about how much vacation leave is left on the table every year. Um, the other thing that, uh, that technology has allowed for us, and this is both good and bad, um, is a decline of trust. So in every single institution in society, we see a decline in trust, whether it's the media, whether it's our, our Congress, education, religion, um, the uh, uh, business. Um, people trust these institutions less than they did a decade, two decades, three decades ago. Um, that's a challenge for creating what I'm calling bigger than me experiences, right? Which require trusting that someone has something to offer you that might be difficult, that might have some kind of transaction cost that might require you to slow down. Um, if you don't trust the curator anymore, if you don't trust the institution, then how will you give yourself over to these bigger than me experiences? Another sign of the decline of authority, this is a, this is a great study. Um, I just can't imagine how anybody would, uh, would, would set this up as a study. Um, <laughs> so what, what they did is they said, I'm going to look and see how many people stop at this stop sign in a small town um, in upper New York. Um, and then I'm going to do that again uh, in like 20 years and see what happens. Right? I mean, it's just, I don't think they got funding for it, but they did it anyway. Um, but again, this idea that, uh, that even, you know, even the stop sign has less authority over us than it once did. Um, this is what it sounds like when we as institutions try to talk to uh, this rising generation. I don't know if you can click that. Okay. That's the language of institutions. That's quiet, listen, wait, look, clap, enter, exit, right? That's what, that's what they hear. That's what the, the younger generation hears when we're trying to market to them. We see them as a demographic. Here's the language of authorship. It's the why, the how, so what, what if, let me try, mix and match, parody, rearrange, always open, always on. Right? It's a very, very different language. And we've got to learn this language of authorship if we're going to connect uh, to new audiences. So two types of experiences. There's the me experience. There's the I creativity, which we should celebrate. It's important. But there's also the bigger than me experiences, which I think are more important now in this world that we live in than ever before. And here's just some of the differences between the two. The first question for a me experience is, what do I have to say to the world? The first question for a bigger than me experience is, what do I need to know? It's about insight, not just voice. It's about reflection, not just expression, right? The me experience is about doing, getting under the hood, making stuff. That's great. The uh, bigger than me is about undergoing. It's about actually going through a process of conflict, of rethinking your, your, your own ideas, coming to a different place at the end. This is what John Dewey talks about in The Art of Experience, the notion of undergoing. Um, me experiences are largely hedonic. They're about pleasure. They're about the thing that makes me feel good today. Right? Bigger than me are about purpose or eudaimonic. Um, me experiences are about identity. Who am I? Right? Who, 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 who can I be? Um, bigger than me is about identification. Who else do I identify with? My community, with history, with larger forces than myself. Um, and that's the difference between the egoistic imagination and the empathic imagination. I think these are really important terms. We all know this. 
We, uh, I think we're all searching for the bigger than me, but our lives and our institutions are set up increasingly to, uh, to, to, to move the, the me experience. So I think this is the big question that we face. How do we become trusted curators in this IWW, IWW, HIWI world? How can we create these bigger than me experiences without reverting to the traditional modes of institutional engagement? Sitting in a darkened theater applauding when it's time to applaud. So I think the pendulum is shifting back to bigger than me. And I want to show you some examples. And uh, first of all, the, the research on millennials, I think, is promising about what, how they're orienting themselves in life. First of all, they're more interested in purpose and social impact than uh, previous generations. Um, we're seeing a big turnaround here in, in what millennials say are important to them. They are completely committed to some sense of authenticity and rich and deep meaning. That's really what they're seeking in their experiences. Uh, and those experiences tend to be deep, immersive, multi-layered. They want them to be shared. This is a version of life catching, but they truly want to share these experiences and be part of shared collective experience. And they're very loyal. Once they've decided there's a brand that speaks to them, they stay committed to it. And they want to be around diversity. This is a key value for them. So rise of intimacy and the triumph of the small. I think this is one place we've got to help our organizations think about. That it's not always about being bigger or growing. But sometimes it's the small thing. These house concerts are spreading. So songwriters, singer-songwriters, are traveling around the country, playing in people's living rooms. The host will bring them in, have a covered dish. People will pay $10 to hear them play. And so they can do three or four of these a week and hit 50, 60 people at a time in a very intimate setting. Not only are they making a living, but they're creating these really intimate, meaningful concert experiences for people across the country and building their loyalty and their brand in the process. The rise of immersive collective experiences. This goes completely against I want what I want, when and how I want it. Festivals, right? This is the fastest growing area of, uh, uh, of, of cultural life. There are, so Coachella uh, this year sold 250,000 passes in 20 minutes. This is not convenient, <laughs> right? You, you wait like six hours in traffic to get there. It's hot, it's sweaty, people are drinking, they're throwing up, you can't go to the bathroom. You're stuck with all these people. But young people are flocking to the festival experience. There's something here that's absolutely important and valuable to them. Um, the rise of demanding brands, right? So Kickstarter is an example of a demanding brand, which is saying, if you, if, if you support me, I need you to show it. You know, I need you to be part of the creative process from the beginning. Invest in me. That's a demanding brand. Here's another example of a demanding brand. This is the, this is the idea that it's not always about convenience. That, in fact, people are willing for inconvenience if, they, if they're part of something they really believe in. Um, so Beck, this is a fascinating, demanding brand. This is the most demanding brand, which is he put out an album of sheet music. If you want to know what it sounds like, you have to play it yourself. <laughs> right? And now people are playing this music all over the world and posting it online, and there's different versions of what his album is supposed to sound like. And he'll probably end up... Uh, performing it, uh, but only after people have already engaged in the music in a very deep way. The rise of serial culture episodic stories. So television is where this is really happening, the house of cards, the notion of being able to binge on a series. But why do we not think about this in terms of our own presentations? Our work is one-off. You go, you experience the culture, cultural presentation, and then you, why can't we serialize like, like Dickens did in the Pickwick Papers? You know, why can't we engage people this, that a, se a season is not a series of discrete performances or presentations. It's maybe one long story that people can participate in from beginning to end. The rise of slow, right? And this is showing up in lots of ways. It's, it's showing up in my 15-year-old daughter who wants uh, a turntable and wants to listen to music on vinyl. And the music industry thought this was a fad. And it's growing every year. It's becoming a significant part of the income source for artists today. What is it about sitting with a physical vinyl 
record and, 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 and listening to it from start to finish uh, that is about slowing down and, again, immersing yourself in the cultural experience. Um, you know, going back to black and white photography, um, the Washington Post talked about the emergence of, of the slow photo movement and community dark rooms where young people and uh, people of all ages are coming together to make photography together. This is a, a young woman who worked for me at Vanderbilt, and she talks about she's one of these uh, slow photo community darkroom folks, and she says it's the whole process that I find pleasure in, and it's not convenient, it's not cheap, and I love this part. She said, if someone wants to see my work, they actually have to see me and hold the print in their hands. Um, again, I mean, clearly she could post her prints online, but this is, this is what she's looking for, a human exchange of her work. Um, the rise of creative process over creative product. So for much of the 20th century, we have taken the creative process, which used to belong to people in their living rooms, and we gave it to professionals, and we said, you only get access to art and culture when it's all done, finished by professionals, out there on the stage, perfect on the wall. Um, people really want to see creativity happening in process. And my example of this is when I went to see the David in Florence, and I walked down that long hall hallway, and there at the end in the rotunda is the David, and there was an art student off to the side who was drawing the David, not very well if I remember, and the 40 people that were there were all gathered around the art student looking at his work, and not a single person was looking at the David, right? Because they want to look over the shoulder of artists, and we have denied people that, and because of that, this is what's filling in. All these reality TV shows around making stuff, Project Runway, The Voice, Dance, right? People get to see artists as they're challenged, as they're working through puzzles, and it's captivating, and this is what we need our institutions to think about, is how do we invite people back into the process? Um, so in, in summary, um, here are some of the things that I think we need to think about. Authentic relationships, not transactions, or transformation, not transaction. So our institutions have become so transactional. We measure our success by transactions. How many tickets we sell, how much money we raise, how many performances we put up on our stages. Um, and in some ways, we need to get to this point where we are thinking more about transformation and impact and less about the transactional measures. Uh, Randy Cohen and I were talking in the lobby before about the seven habits of highly successful people. And there's a two-by-two -two box that that author creates about um, important and urgent. And so there's the non-important and the non-urgent. And I hope none of us are in that box. Um, <laughs> There's the important and urgent box, which is where most of us find ourselves. But the most important box to be in is the important and non-urgent. That box that allows us to develop something into a transformational service product experience, um, rather than being focused so much on, on, the, on the transaction. Um, slowing down, not speeding up. Conversations, rather than marketing and sales. Again, this is sort of the. How, is, as institutions, are we part of really important two-way conversations? Uh, we, should get, we should completely rename. If we have marketing departments, we've got to change that. Marketing to a demographic does not matter in this world anymore. That, is not, that does not matter. It's about having a significant relationship with potential audiences, with co-collaborators. It's a completely different way of thinking. And how about doing less instead of more? This is what a transactional world leads us to, which is we measure ourselves by how much we do. Right? And we all worry that we don't have enough money to do all the things that we do. And so the solution to that is to do something else, to add on. Right? Maybe the solution is to do less. Maybe instead of filling your stage every single night of the year, maybe you do two or three transformative things that are deeply connected in every possible way. Right? Um, how about open sourcing our institutions? So I think we need to realize that the best ideas are probably not our own. And if we do less instead of more, and then we open our institutions for the best ideas, say so you figure out how to use this asset better, how to connect it, how to deepen it, how to make it as compelling as possible, what would that look like? So I think for much of the first 20 years of American cultural policy that began in the mid-1950s, early 1960s, it was about excellence. It was about investing in the professional arts so that we could build a truly excellent arts ecology that would rival 
uh, our European neighbors in terms of the richness and the talent of the arts. And we did a great job. Um, and then we started worrying that we had built this magnificent uh, arts ecology, and we were wondering, well, who's going to, you know, who, who's going to come? Uh, is it accessible? So we kind of talked about excellence, and then we switched, and for about 20 years, we talked about access. Uh, how do we give people access to these amazing cultural treasures that we've built? I think we're now in this era, in the era of impact, in the era of looking and saying, we have got an incredibly uh, powerful, rich, multi-layered arts ecology. We've, suc we've succeeded over the last 40 years in building it. And now we've got to think about how we deploy it to achieve maximum impact in people's lives. Um, and I think increasingly that impact has to be about bigger than me experiences. Um, this slide needs some work. Um, I want to say, I guess I want to, I want to say one other thing. Which is, um, which is this statistic. Right? In 2010, the first year that non-white babies made up the majority of babies born in the United States of America. So one of the things is when we're looking at statistics about arts participation and about what, what's happening with the millennials, this is typically based on college graduates um, who have money, right? Because the, 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 the marketing firms that do these studies care about who's spending their money. And there's a whole nother river in American life that doesn't match up necessarily to all these things that we read about millennials. And uh, it's, 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 it's changing everything we do. You know, I, I heard the statistic the other day that there are more people who have attended some college and not graduated than there are college graduates in this country. It's an incredible statistic. So we are in this moment when impact matters more than other, when, when bigger than me experiences are the only things that will help us learn how to live in this new reality, how to, how to connect across cultures, how to connect across generations. We have got to be the place. I think the arts are the only place that can help this country move forward so that there aren't two separate rivers, but we are together collectively collaborating, creating our futures together, um, and, and experiencing these transformative, bigger-than-me moments. That's where the arts have to be, and we've got to stop being transactional. We've got to figure out how we achieve that mission. It's so important. So thank you for your time. Um, I think there's a session this afternoon for people who want to follow up this conversation. I'd love to talk to more of you about what you're doing in your communities to get your communities and individuals to these bigger than me moments. Um, is there any, is it, what's happening right after me? I want to make this a good handoff. Okay, Tom's got the mic, thank you. <laughs>